Welcome to Let's Crack UPSC CSC English. About me, I'm Sandeep Bhushan and my credentials are I have 8 years of teaching experience for civil services. I teach international relations, internal security and in-depth analysis of editorials and articles which will be very much useful for film exams as well as the mains examinations. And this video is in regards to how to crack prelims 2020. Prior to getting into the topic, you need to go ahead with a subscription. You have a notification for all the subscription that is Let's Crack UPSC CSC with India's largest learning platform that is an academy. Once you subscribe, you will have access to unlimited live and recorded courses with India's best educators. And the privileges you would get once you subscribe is the daily live classes. You can chat with your educator, engage in discussions, ask your doubts and be part of the answer polls. You also have live tests and quizzes wherein you can evaluate your preparation with our regular mock tests and quizzes and also get detailed analysis on your performance. You also have structured courses. All our courses are structured in line with UPSC exam syllabus, which will help you best prepare for the examination. You also have the unlimited access. That is, upon subscription, you get access to all our live and recorded courses to watch from your comfort zone, that is, either mobile or laptop. You also have the top educators, they are Sudarshan Gurjar, Ayush Sanghi. Prakash Kumar and Runal Patel. You have special classes by Dr. Roman Saini, Dr. Siddharth Arora, Lokendra Chauhan, Rakesh Verma, and Ashish Malik. You also have the upcoming courses in our Unacademy platform. They are capsule course on 250 multiple choice questions for UPSC prelims. You also have the comprehensive course on public administration. You also have capsule course on geography optional and also on Let's Crack UPSC CSC 2021. And in regards to the UPSC CSC subscription, you have 12 months of subscription and also 24 months subscription. So when you are going ahead with 12 month subscription, the price would be 40,000. But if you are using my code while you subscribe, that is my code SBT10. So you can get additional 10% on the 40,000, the original price. And then you will get the price for 36,000. And when you are subscribing for 24 months with my code SBT10, Upon 52,000, you would get 10% discount and the amount would come up to 46,800. So, it is always recommended that you go ahead with the preparation for civil services at least one to two years, a solid, serious preparation. And wherein this preparation will make you clear that you would have an edge over others. And by having two, two years of preparation, that is, you are recommended to go ahead with 24 month subscription. And once you go ahead with a 24 month subscription, you would be an added advantage because for 24 months, you are paying for only 12 months plus one month. That is one year plus one month, whatever amount you would be paying, you would get it the subscription for 24 months. So this is the best opportunity you can go ahead. So go ahead with subscription for 24 months and take the benefit from the academy. And not only that you can view my classes, but along with my classes, you can go ahead with viewing all the classes of the all the top educators in regards to various other subjects. And now we'll get into the topic that is the Hindu. We go ahead with the in-depth analysis of editorials and articles of the Hindu newspaper. And the topics to be discussed today are in regards to mandate and in regards to China zero and in regards to economic tsunami. So we will look at each one of them, how it will be useful for you all, that is the viewers and the civil servant aspirants, 
that it will help you to score more marks in the prelims, be comfortable in the prelims as well as score good marks in the mains examination. So the first editorial you have is in regards to the mandate. But what is the mandate, what the editor or the heading of the editor is, editorial is, that is stealing a mandate. So we will look at what has happened in Madhya Pradesh and then how the mandate has been stealed by one party to by one party to another party. So the mandate here is that we all are aware that in Madhya Pradesh there was a political instability and the political instability was because of the 22 MLAs who have resigned from one political party and then they have made sure that the government would fall and in the process there was supposed to take a flow test that is to prove the majority in the house that is they had the confidence in the house with the required strength to sustain in the house so that the government can run. So yes we are talking about Madhya Pradesh assembly and in the Madhya Pradesh assembly by the engineer resignations of 22 MLS it was very clear that the government of the day or the Kamal Nath government was forced to go ahead with the flow test. So when it was supposed to go ahead with the flow test to prove its majority, the Kamal Nath government initially was not ready or hesitant to go ahead with the flow test. But we have seen the governor writing a letter to the Kamal Nath government that there is a necessity to prove the majority on the house that is through the flow test. But initially Kamal Nath has said that it is not required to prove the majority because they have the majority and the one who is supposed to prove has to prove the majority. But once the 22 MLS could not be part of the Kamal Nath government, so it was very clear that there the Madhya Pradesh was heading towards insta political instability and in turn the issue was totally in the hands of the Supreme Court. When it has go gone to the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court has ordered the Madhya Pradesh Assembly Speaker to go ahead with conducting a flow test. So, the entire political instability or the entire political drama which has prevailed almost a week has been ended by the Supreme Court order. And the Supreme Court has given an order to the Speaker that it is the need of the hour to conduct a flow test. So when it was made it very clear to be conducted a flow test, then the Kamal Nath government has made it very sure that they wouldn't go ahead with the flow test because they do not have the number. So it was very clear that they were in the minority only with 92 members. So when there was only 92 members, because of the resignation of the 22 members, the Halfway mark of the assembly, Madhya Pradesh assembly has gone to 104. When it has gone to 104, wherein the actual total strength of the MP assembly is 230, in which 24 seats are now vacant. That is along with the 22 and the rest too. So, when the halfway mark is 104, the Kamal Nath government with only 92 members could not prove the majority, thereby the Kalma Kamal Nath government did not go ahead or it did not undertake the flow test and wherein the other political party which was in opposition had 106 in their stride and then it was very clear that even though if the Kamal Nath government goes ahead with the flow test they will be unable to prove the majority thereby Kamal Nath government has decided that they will not go for the flow test and this is all that because of the Supreme Court has given an order that there has to be a compulsion of the flow test. And we will look at the bench which was headed by Justice D.Y. Chandrachur. He has said that or he has given an order that there has to be a video conferencing or video recording which has to take place when the flow test goes ahead. And if possible, even the live streaming of the assembly proceedings have to go ahead. So this was an order 
given or it was passed to the speaker of the house that this is the way or the condition the flow test has to go ahead that is in regards to video recording and also in regards to the live streaming so we will look at the challenges we have seen that yes now the political instability what was prevailing in what you say the curtain i mean it has been decided or the curtains have been raised by the supreme court order and then now it's very clear that the political party which has the majority to prove the majority on the house that with the flow test then now they will go ahead with forming the government but prior to that we will also look at what are the challenges so what kind of challenges that because of the engineer resignations or because of the mass resignations or because of the change of god or because of the power tussle and, and the what do you say the kind of defection what's going on not only in madhya pradesh but we have also experience of we have seen in karnataka and also we have seen in the northeastern states we have also seen in the telangana state so all this considering into we had definitely heading towards the challenges and these challenges are the one which will really what do you say cause a dent to the electoral process itself the kind of voters have confidence in the electoral democracy or the democratic country that is the one of the important point of the democracy is the electoral process so when we have that kind of faith by the entire citizens especially by the voters in regards to the electoral system so what are the challenges so we will look at them that is and the first more is the power tussle so this is the one which is actually I mean popping up from one state to another state so when it is popping up from one state to another state it is evident that this kind of engineered resignations and defections are bound to take place and which is the this power power tussle is because of they wanted to claim the majority in the legislation and this has considerably making sure that the government of the day they are falling short because of the seats which are vacant because of the either resignation or defection this is the biggest challenge because the power tussle it is not the actual process which has to be that is to save the nation there is nothing called save the nation but even though if it is saving the people or saving the nation or what is it serving the people of the country who have voted for them the first and foremost what is emerging is the power tussle and this model of shifting the gears from one political to another political party we are experiencing it that is it is happening recurrence so when it is happening recurrence across the states in india this is leading to or heading towards an unhealthy pattern so when it is heading towards an unhealthy pattern it creates a fresh challenge to the clean politics so whatever clean politics have been initiated or was there since 1952 the first general elections but each and every general elections after 1952 we are seeing that or we are experiencing that we are not having or there is challenge to the clean politics so this is also a challenge and then you have a legal and moral implication on the mass resignation and this is creating an kind of what do you say upset to the electoral verdict so whatever the voters have voted during the elections it is upsetting the electoral verdict itself so the voters have given the verdict to ex political party to form the government but because of the mass resignation or engineered resignation the there is an up upset to the electoral verdict itself and this upset to the electoral verdict 
need to be examined at the political and also judicial level. This is very very important because the kind of power, power tussle which is taking up in every state, wherever there is a thin margin, when one political party is forming the government, then the electoral verdict is upset and mass resignations are taking place. And due to this challenge, it is necessary that it has to be examined by the political and the judicial levels. And the impending change of God. That means there is always and happening that is the change of God is taking place. Whenever the change of God is taking place and especially in the case in Madhya Pradesh, it is also a disgraceful betrayal to the popular mandate. So, the electoral verdict what I have used here and then the same kind of what you say upset to the electoral verdict and to the popular mandate. What the voters are actually giving to one political party is not for five years. But all of a sudden because of the mass resignations, we are experiencing that it is a kind of disgraceful betrayal to the voters or to the entire popular mandate which is being given by the voters to the political parties to serve the state. So this is at stake. And then we are also seeing this route, the mass resignation. I repeat, the mass resignation is used as a route to bypass the anti-defection. The mass resignation is used to bypass the anti-defection law. And you need not be surprised if there is a question in the mains also that the recent or recent past of engineered resignations have become or have led a route to bypass the anti-defection law comment. So you will definitely be in a position to write an answer in regards to the mains and also if there are what you say the statements given in regards to the prelims you'll also be very well equipped by the class that what you have to pick up which is not part of the answer in the preliminary. So, mass resignations heading towards or leading towards bypassing the anti-defection law and then it is only for the power tussle. Not only that, but the financial and moral corruption involved in this entire, what do you say, mass resignation and the power tussle is very, very evident and it is need of the political and judicial levels at political and judicial levels that the clean politics or else the electoral verdicts and the popular mandate has to be taken into consideration or has to be given due importance. So wherein these are the challenges which are actually being faced across the states in India and this has to be cleansed. When we are talking about all this in regards to the route to bypass the anti-defection and for the benefit of the civil services aspirant, we will also talk about or discuss about anti-defection law. So, this anti-defection law is mentioned in the 10th schedule which was inserted in the constitution in the year 1985. So, in 1985 in the 10th schedule as per 52nd amendment act the anti-defection law was introduced so for prelims point of view make it very clear that 52nd amendment act and then which was is in the 10th schedule is referred to as an anti-defection law and the anti-defection law, it lays down the process wherein the legislature may be disqualified or else it lays down the process on what grounds the legislature would be disqualified or on what grounds of defection the legislature would be disqualified. And the legislature would be disqualified 
by the presiding officer and the presiding officer is the one who would decide on what grounds the legislator can be disqualified when he or she is defecting the party or the electoral mandate and then he would i mean the presiding officer would decide the defection and disqualify the legislator based on the petition by any member of the house so and the defection law clearly states that it lays down the process wherein it will give strength or the powers to the presiding officer to disqualify the legislator on the grounds of defection wherein it can be done based on the petition by any member of the house and a legislator is deemed to be defector either voluntarily or whenever he wants to give up the membership of his party or he can be defected or he will be under defection when he disobeys the directives of the party in which he is or she is so one more point in regards to anti defection is the legislator is deemed to be defected on two ways by two ways that is one is voluntarily or the other one is when he or she disobeys and this anti defection law implies that the legislator who is defying or abstaining from the voting wherein the particular party has issued a whip but in spite of that the member has gone against it defying it then it is deemed that the, the legislator can also be disqualified on the basis of that the legislator did not abide by the whip issued by the political party either it is the ruling party or the opposition party and this anti defection law applies to both parliament that is the central government and also to the state assembly when i say it is the parliament that is to the lok sabha and to the state assemblies so this is in regards to the 10th schedule and also in regards to the what we have discussed the supreme court order that asking the speaker to go ahead with the floor test so we have looked at what is anti defection law and then the anti defection law also has a paragraph that is paragraph 2 of the 10th schedule which talks about the disqualification that means the paragraph 2 of the 10th schedule very specifically mentions on what grounds the legislator or the law maker can be disqualified and this pertains to articles 101 102 190 and 191 were changed which were part of the 10th schedule of the constitution which talks about the disqualification of the law makers and there is something else in regards to the disqualification that means the disqualification doesn't take place or it takes not only takes place only when an individual legislator is shifting the stance or shifting from one political to another political party but what happens is it can happen when there is a merger taking place so the merger can take place and in case of the merger of two parties the merger can take place only when the total strength of the existing political party members upon that one third of the party legislators shift their stands or move away from the parent party to the another political party so in that case the one third of the number when they are moving or shifting from parent party to another political party it is termed as not defection but as merger so when the merger takes place it is not illegal or it is not unconstitutional it is it doesn't fall under anti defection so to escape from the anti defection the new trend which is happening nowadays or recent past is they are making sure that they wait till x number of legislators move away or drift their stand from one political to another political party and once they get the number as one third 
so then they merge their political party to another political party or they move away from one political party and they merge with the other political party so this was first constitution of india initially thought that defection should not take place which is against the mandate against the mandate of the voters or electoral system but they have again added that one third is must for the mergers of the parties so even this was not stopping the political parties to shift or to merge or defect on the sidelines of merging the political parties from one to another so it was it has become a daily routine and then it has moved ahead from you say state to state not by defection but through the process of merger then again in the year 2003 again in the year 2003 we have seen that as per the 91st amendment act which was which has passed that the number will be raised from the one third to the two third when there has to be a merger of pol one political party that is old party to the new party when they are going ahead so old party to the new party when the joining takes place the merger has to be minimum two third so they have changed or amended from one third to the two third expecting that the defection will not take place but we are also experiencing that two third is also taking place so there has to be something where the parliament that is the what do you say the the lok sabha and rajya sabha and also judiciary has to look into it very seriously that the merger with the two third and then shifting the stand from one political to another political party which is against the mandate of the electoral process so for prelims point of view we have looked at the amendment acts and then which 50 i mean which amendment act the anti defection has actually come into existence and what are the ways that and legislator can be defected and we have also seen the merger rising from one third to two third which could be part of the preliminary question so now we will along with the what do you say the kind of explanation we have looked for the anti defection we will also look at the float test because it was this float test wherein the supreme court has ordered to the kamal nath government that this the recent one in the madhya pradesh assembly that the kamal nath government has to go ahead with a float test so when it has ordered for a float test it is the what do you say importance for you all as a preliminary point of view that we will also for the benefit of the viewers and the civil servant aspirants we will also focus on the float test so the flow test is the conclusive proof of numbers in the house so it determines the number you have and it is a proof that how many numbers the political party which is in the government wants to prove that it wants to continue in the house so once it's any political party either in government or in the opposition which wants to prove that or it says that i have the proof of numbers so it has to prove the numbers by a proof in the house by the float test so float test is the conclusive proof of numbers in the house and the supreme court's constitutional bench judgment of 1994 that is in the sr bomai case has introduced the concept of float test again this for the prelims point of view very important that when did the word flow test or the concept of the flow test has actually come into existence that is by the supreme court's constitutional bench judgment of 1994 that is in specific in regards to the sr bomai case has introduced the concept of flow test so this again for the prelims point of view that which among the following cases has the supreme court constitutional bench judgment in 1994 introduced the concept of flow test so you will have various
or the four cases and one amongst the one which is the right answer for the prelims is given yes these two also come into existence but when few of them are being resi are, are resigned or a lot has resigned so as per the sr bombay case there has to be a float test but in that case the mandate of the people and the will of the people is at stake is not taken into consideration or where else or the voting or electoral process itself is at stake so there has to be some kind of mechanism in place that the float test nowadays is also not as per the will of the people because when they have resigned and when the short is i mean shortfall is taking place then the strength of the house will reduce when the strength of the house reduces then the opposition party whichever is in the party which is in opposition will have the chance to prove the majority and then that political party will run the show or will form the government but which is against the will of the people which is against the electoral mandate which is against the mandate of the people so definitely there is something i mean a, a dent or the gap which is actually happening in the politics wherein the politics are not clear or which are not as per the democratic system so electoral reforms have to take place and that has to be decided by the parliament so now we will go ahead with the second one that is china zero so we have seen it very clear that the editorial talks about the china that is the zero so what is that zero what the the editor is talking about or the number in the entire editorial is certainly the um, i mean the count which was very high or it was surging from december that is from the first week or the second week of january till almost march it was surging that the number of cases with the symptoms of coronavirus and the number of death cases have really what you say shoot up that it was very difficult to contain but china has a whole has come together and it has contained to zero that means there is a great effort done by the entire chinese administration along with the doctors along with the medical staff nurses and along with the what do you say entire citizens who have supported to make sure that the epidemic of that is the coronavirus to make sure that the prevent i mean the virus doesn't spread has taken into effect by a collective responsibility so because of the collective responsibility when china was the epicenter for this covid 19 but in spite of that okay there has been what you say the loss of li lives which has taken place but they have made sure that the graph which has gone very high has come down to zero and that is because of the coordinated effort and that coordinated effort was done by or taken by the initiative by the government and supported by the citizens of china now we will look at that in the dates of march 18 to 20 there were zero cases in wuhan including wuhan that is the entire china but on march 21st china experienced again one case which is the local transmission they have experienced or they have what you say had one case through the local transmission from an imported case from an imported case which was again later on at local transmission in the guangdong province they have experienced one more case and on march 22nd china has reported 314 overall 314 reported cases so now we have seen that from the very high of the death cases they have made it to zero so we will look at what were the challenges 
the Chinese government has faced in between this high to zero. So definitely is loss of life between this graph, but at the same time, what challenges they have actually faced so that these challenges can be met very comfortably by the rest of the countries which are experiencing the spread of virus which is very virulent in different parts of the world. So we will look at the challenges and the challenges are that the total mortality that is the deaths because of the coronavirus or COVID-19 in the entire mainland China was around many countries are adopting these tough measures, the stringent measure, measures or the stricter measures that is individuals rights are not important at this juncture. What is important or what prevails over individual is the community rights and that is best suitable at this pandemic time that is COVID-19. And we should also learn that initially China has gone ahead with restricting the travel, banning mass gathering and cancelling important events and shutting down the educational institutions and all the entertainments. Why they have gone ahead with this entire restricting? Because to cut the transmission chain. So what is important or what has been done by China and now even what India is going ahead is that the total lockdown is happening in India right from what you say Sunday that is yesterday we have experienced the Janta curfew which is the foremost to make sure that the, we have to break the chain, we have to cut the transmission chain and this is we can go ahead with cutting the transmission chain of the coronavirus by making sure the individual individual rights are not important or individual rights can be prevailed by the community rights and thereby implementing or restricting all this to make sure that the spread of virus do not take place violently. And China has also informed WHO about the novel virus unlike the case in what SARS that is in 2002 it has break, outbreak. And China has quickly sequenced, that is sequencing the genome of the coronavirus, that is COVID-19. So that is very important initially, so that this data or this information will provide certainly the base of the platform to go ahead with clinically tested drugs for COVID-19. And this test achievement or the contribution by China, making sure that they have gone ahead with the sequencing of the genome of the virus. This is very important and made the data public and it has shared 126 sequence data to WHO which is very essential at this time so that WHO again can go ahead with the entire scientists or the researchers across the world, I mean across the, the countries in the, in the world to make sure that everyone sits together and then they go ahead with the clinically tested drug to come out as soon as possible. But as per to the ICMR, that is Indian Council Medical Research, it says that it takes at least two years for the clinically tested drug to come into existence. So this sharing of the genome sequencing of the virus and the data of the virus it provides the scientific papers published by i mean also by the scientific papers published by chinese researchers will give a head start that they would go ahead with better understanding the, about the virus disease and then go ahead with coming up with the clinically tested drug which will create a better relief for the world but not now, but probably close to two years. And now we will look at another one which talks about the perils of all out lockdown. The perils of all out lockdown. That means there is a lockdown which India is experiencing. And the lockdown has been initiated by 
the Prime Minister of India by a new concept that is by the Janta curfew. So initiated by the Janta curfew, later on started by the lockdown and why this Janta curfew and lockdown is for the betterment of the humankind itself. That means betterment in regards to the public health itself. Not that the government wanted to impose something wherein the people do not like. No, at this juncture, when people are interested and then they are voluntarily going ahead with this, had gone ahead with Janta curfew and then they also are accepting the lockdown. And this lockdown is for the betterment of the people, that is for the humankind, that is for the public health of the entire country. So we will look at, yes, there is definitely kind of impact, negative impact on the health and on the economy. And this negative impact on the health and economy is a double blow or double crisis when India is facing, already been facing by the economic slowdown. And added to the economic slowdown, the coronavirus spread has brought in a double blow to the country. So double blow is to the economy, that is to the economic crisis. It is, I mean, leading or India is heading towards economic crisis. And the other one is in regards to the health crisis. So definitely two crises are emerging now at this juncture because of the coronavirus spread in India and the one is health crisis and the one other one is economic crisis. This is important for Prince point of view and also for Main's point of view. When I have been repeating in all my other I mean previous videos that it is very essential that you have to link the COVID-19 that is the pandemic versus the economic or the impact of econ econ on economy. So pandemic versus economy I was talking about. So now, yes, it is high time that we have to think about the health crisis or the impact of the coronavirus spread on health crisis and also on the economic crisis. And in regards to the casualties what India has faced is as of now confined but definitely there are chances that if the lockdown is not taken very seriously and if the lockdown is, what do you say, taken for granted as such and we are just moving ahead and the social gatherings takes place, then definitely the casualties will not be to the confined number, but it would be at a growing fast. The numbers would be growing fast. <clears throat> So what is important here we look at is the economic crisis is hitting at a full force. The economic crisis is hitting at a full force and then the impact of the impact on the economy is in regards to millions and the millions we are talking about in regards to revenue loss and also many of them have lost their works and this will hurt the poor people the most. So what is important for the government of India is to make sure that they protect the lives of the people. Also they protect the poor people who would lose their jobs. As such it has started and it will blow further. That means the works or the job loss also will hit the number, the graph of the job loss will also rise and that it will certainly impact the herds, I mean impact the poor people a lot. So health crisis and economic crisis have to be taken into consideration by the government when the preventive measures have been taken into consideration, the stricter measure and the Janta curfew followed by the lockdown. And this impact I have referred it to or we have taken the heading as economic tsunami. <clears throat> when we look at this there are two possibilities that means when you wanted the lockdown to take place completely or effectively so that we will be what do you say greatly making sure that the spread of virus doesn't take place so 
in that case the people have to stay at home certainly there is a lockdown people have to stay so when people have to stay the the people are staying or the motive of the government for the people to stay at home are two reasons what are they one is self protective protection motive no doubt about it we are trying to uh, what do you say uh, take care of our health individual selves but at the same time there is something called as public purpose motive and please do understand these two keywords for the benefit of the viewers i am reiterating my statement please do understand the two possible motives because of the lockdown by the government which is a good step and also accepted by the people and they have done it because of this self protection to protect ourselves individuals and the other one is public purpose motive one is self one is public one is private one is public so both are taken into what do you say action so look at very the way the government has come up so that the people are taking the initiative as private for themselves at the same time they are also worried about public probably many of the people individuals are not aware that that they are also thinking for the public no doubt it, it is that they are thinking for themselves but they are also thinking for the public that is the entire human kind it could be their brothers or sisters or the entire community itself so it's a good move good initiative taken up by the government and in the first case that is the self protection is because of the act of fear the self protection of the private thinking of about ourselves is because of the fear and the other one is because of the collective efforts so either whatever it is we are making sure that we are definitely trying to restrict the spread of coronavirus if we do not restrict it it would spread virulent and once it spread virulence then it will impact a greater casualties to take place in india which we do not want it we want prevention is better than cure as such the cure the medicine would be only after 2 years so what is the imperative and important step or method or model to be incorporated right at this moment is prevention and it has enlightened reason that not to protect ourselves but to contribute to the collective efforts so it has inculcated the lockdown has inculcated the responsibility of being collective or to contribute to the collective efforts so it's a very good move a, a, a kind of instilling the responsibility that is collective responsibility very good it is protecting ourselves instilling a collective responsibility efforts to halt the epidemic and the public purpose must include the possible economic consequences so definitely when people are, are at home what will definitely create a kind of concern for the the one who is sitting at home is definitely the economic consequences economic consequences initially it starts with the individual and then it will creep to the i mean community and then it will creep to the society and it will creep further to the state economy and further it will add to the or it will i mean dent to the national economy so wherein the indian economy has to be protected so the entire consequence of what we are actually saying it is a good move that is it is instilling the responsibility of collective efforts very good but it would also impact the economic consequences <clears throat> so keeping the public services in view there has to be the government has to come up with an initiative and a creativity how the public services will be taken into consideration wherein the essential services will be what do you say uh, 
will not be i mean essential services will be continued there will not be a an halt for the supply of the essential services and an official guideline has to be given and it will be given it is given by the government wherein it will make sure that there is no i mean the hoardings which takes place and then there is no black marketing which comes into existence so we will look at the challenges now what are the challenges what actually in the due course of my lecture wherein i was talking about it is a good move we are trying to protect ourselves we are also thinking not only thinking about ourselves that is individuals selfishness but at the same time thinking about the public we are also thinking about or else instilling our, i mean the the kind of res responsibility that is collective responsibility but in turn there is something which will hit also the economic consequences so what are the challenges that is the challenges the migrant workers street vendors contract workers almost everyone in the informal sector this is very important the keyword informal sectors when we are talking about in regards to preliminary point of view because the question framed by the upsc will not be direct on the covid 19 or to the economic consequences he could i mean the the upsc could focus or frame the question on the impact of the economic economy of the nation or the gdp of the nation but the focus could be on the informal sector and based on the informal sector the question could be could be formed so my lecture is focusing not only just on the what you say the measures or the challenges what we have to take the measures what we have to take the making sure that there is more liquidity which has to be pumped into the market to make sure that the the economic consequences will move from the negative to the positive but the question could be from the informal sector so you need to understand the keyword the informal sector so how much percent of the informal sector constitute to the gdp and how this will impact the maximum the indian economy so thereby the challenge now when the people are locked down is to the informal sector sector so your understanding or your preparation or strategy has to be that the lockdown versus informal sector lockdown versus impact on informal sector so when it is impacting the informal sector no doubt at a greater strength or a greater impact on the indian economy and i am saying this the informal sector is the bulk of the workforce so when this is the bulk of the workforce definitely informal sector plays a vital role when it is denting to the gdp of the nation so for plain point of view and mains point of view and also strategic preparation linking with one topic to another topic and then getting back into the what do you say the the keywords which are mentioned in the newspaper or the news item and then pick up that and then again focus that so that you are making sure that you are not missing any kind of what do you say Uh, topic or sub topics from the preparation or to the civil services preliminary examination so it will impact and this is called as or it could be the economic tsunami if we are not thinking about it if you are not trying to focus on this informal sector so definitely it would be an economic tsunami for sure and this could be also your mains question wherein the lockdown the lockdown would impact on the informal sector because informal sector being the bulk of the workforce if not taken into consideration or if it is not looked at it very seriously if alternative measures are not taken care then it would emerge as a economic tsunami in india comment now we will move further that with the transport routes dislocated that means there is definitely a lockdown and then there is way haphazard manner wherein the only the essential commodities have to be uh, what do you say moved or it has to be taken into consideration the rest have to be locked down and then this dislocated 
will impact on the further wheat harvest because this is a source of survival for many or millions of labors that is the agricultural labors especially in the north india and this will impact again further the economy or the in the north india itself and this scale of relief measures or the radical expansion requires big money that is huge liquidity is required by the central government to relieve or give relief or to move out of the challenges <clears throat> and because of this we have already the uh, what do you say the crisis affected sectors in the economy already being part of it and then we have the npas part of it and then when the big money or else the radical expansion of the money is being pumped by the central government to take care or protect the informal sector probably i'm just saying probably there could be a lobbying again by the crisis affected sectors for the packages and this would also be a challenge for the government itself and then these lockdowns may be neither that epidemic is to be controlled but poor people cannot stay for longer period of time so this is very important how the government goes ahead with helping the needy one and then this is very clear that we have to go ahead with some kind of social security system again this is a key word for you for the prelims and mains point of view that social security system has to be taken into consideration and when i'm talking about the social security system yes there are the measures which have to be taken by the government of india by going ahead with the social security schemes that is the pds public distribution and then by the mahatma gandhi national rural employment guarantee act and by the pds system by making sure that the take home rations can be provided and then these welfare schemes that is the social security schemes can be utilized can be used by the government of india to make sure that the people who are sitting at home because of the lockdown should not face any kind of negative impact which would create an economic tsunami because most of them are from the informal sector and this has to be made sure that because we are going ahead with the social distancing and making sure that the public spaces are emptied because of the lockdown the government has to go ahead with the measures and then the conclusion is that the urgent need for effective social security measures this is very very important for prelims point of view the question could be based on the informal sector or the question could be based on the social security measures so this social security measures what india does have it in place makes and more important to avoid a loss of nerve that is making sure that people will not lose confidence in the government but people will be protected or public which are at home because of the lockdown would be protected and this effective social security measures have to be taken into consideration for the effective government governance to take place the need of the hour for the government so this could be a, again question in the mains and then it could be said discuss so when i am saying discuss so the kind of explanation what i have done through my class lecture will definitely create a sense that you have understood from films and you have a better understanding and then a comprehensive manner about how to prepare for films and also for the mains and i hope this session of in depth analysis of the editorials and articles have made you more knowledgeable and informative for preliminary point of view and mains point of view and thereby you please like the video you subscribe the video and hit the bell button when you are watching in the youtube that is the let's crack upsc csc english youtube video and then you can get 10% discount by using my code that is sbt10 that is sandeep bhushan tumala 10 code you can use and you can subscribe for an academy that is let's crack let's crack upsc csc english thank you and see you tomorrow at 7 pm